123, Brother Steve, I'm sorry. I got it on now. We're good to go. I apologize. Uh, pray for Buster and Lisa. I talked to Buster this afternoon. Uh, they are uh, in uh, Ohio. He finishes up the meeting there on, uh, uh, on tomorrow evening. And then uh, they'll be driving to Indiana, and he'll be preaching on Father's Day. And they leave after the service uh, there on Sunday and will be driving to Missouri. And he'll be in a meeting there. And they'll leave Missouri next Friday morning coming to Elizabeth Terrace for the service on Friday night. And he'll be preaching here. And uh, the, uh, the older children will be staying there going to a Christian camp uh, there for a couple of weeks. And so it uh, won't be anybody but Buster and Lisa and, and Emma Grace. So they'll be having a good time on their way home. Psalms 123. I've had an enjoyable time studying this 123rd Psalm. Let me share something interesting before we read the psalm. Let me share something interesting with you that I found. Now, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't find things readily. I've, I've never been able to find four-leaf clover. I, I've had friends that could get out on the ground and, and, and just reach and pick up a four-leaf clover. I, I've never been able to find a four-leaf clover. I've had good friends get out of the car at, at Walmart and, and just reach down and pick up a $20 bill. I do well to find a penny coming to the car. I just don't find anything very readily. And so when I say I found this, I'm, I, what I'm saying is I was helped to find this. But I found something interesting about this particular section of the book of Psalms. Uh, we talked about as we began in Psalms 120 that these next 15 Psalms uh, have that little subtitle uh, underneath, the, uh, underneath the, the, the numerical number of the psalm, a song of degrees. And that, that word degrees means ascent, songs of ascent. And uh, mo most Bible scholars, those who spend enough time studying to dig through a number of different ideas, believe that these psalms were used by the children of Israel making their way to the city of Israel uh, to celebrate one of the feasts that were taking place, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Passover, one of the, one of the feasts. And so they would sing these psalms going up. Jerusalem was up, and wherever you came from, you'd be going up to the city of, of Jerusalem. But I, my attention was called to the fact this week that there is a, there's a threefold pattern in, in these psalms that we're studying. Here's what I mean. We begin with a psalm of trouble. Then we move to a psalm of trust. And then we move to a psalm of triumph. Let, let me show it to you. Look, look in, uh, at Psalms 120. Notice the first three words. The psalmist says, in my distress. That immediately calls uh, in, into focus the fact that he's having difficulty. Look at Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes. That means the Spirit of the Lord is digging in his heart and he's trusting the Lord. And then last week we looked at Psalms 122 and he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And that speaks of triumph in his life. Now what you'll find is, is five different times the Psalms break. We're, we're going to start uh, we finished up the triumph Psalm 122, and we're going to another trouble Psalm tonight. 123, 24, and 25 will follow that same pattern. Uh, trouble in 123, trust in 124, and triumph in 125. And you'll find that all the way through all 15 of these Psalms. And, you know, I thought as, I, as, as my attention was drawn to that, do you know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of life in this world. Trouble, trust, triumph. That, that's what life is all about. <laughs> Every one of our, we go, through those, we go through those cycles in our life, a cycle of trouble. And, 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 and let, let me tell you something, trouble's not bad in your life if it brings into focus the Lord. Trouble may be the very best thing that God could ever do in your life if you've lost your focus on Him. I have often got on my face as a, as a pastor praying for people in church who got unfaithful and praying for God to bring trouble in their life so they'd know that they have need of Him. You say, what an awful thing. No, it's not awful. Because if you're not trusting the Lord, you're not going to have victory in your life. And, and all that's ahead is going to be destruction and defeat in your life. 
And, and so this is a picture of life. In this study, we, we finish that first sequence, and that means we're back in trouble again here in, in, in chapter 122. Last week, uh, or 123, last week, uh, we found the psalmist uh, had reached Jerusalem and uh, he was joyfully gathering with God's people for worship. And tonight, in 123, we find him back to the place of problem because he'll mention mocking and scorn and contempt again. Psalms 123 takes a step backwards from 122, but there is still progress. You, you see, as I said, this is a cycle of life. And that's the way life cycles. But just because trouble comes again doesn't mean you're losing ground. It just simply means God's trying to take you a step higher in your walk with him. In Psalms 120, the psalmist was surrounded by trouble and he was all alone. Read that 120th Psalm again. He was by himself. Now, as we come to 123, he's again facing persecution. But as you read this 123rd Psalm, he's not alone now. He, he's with the people of God. 122 has taken him to the house of God. Now he's with the saints of God and, and uh, there's strength to be drawn. As I, as I preached a few weeks ago, well, as, as we talked about last Wednesday night, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. That's one of the benefits of worshiping and being a part of the family of God. Make friends of the family of God. Those who, are, who walk with the Lord, make friends of those people because they are going to be the ones who are going to help you in those discouraging times of your life. Let me, let me tell you, I not one time had a lost friend call me and say, hey, I'd like you to know I'd been thinking about you since your daughter's been in prison. Not one time. I haven't had one of those people. I'm talking about people I've helped. I'm talking about people that, that I know as well as I know family members, but none of them have called me and said, hey, I, I just want you to know that we're sorry about all this and, and we're thinking about you. But I can tell you what, I've had a multitude of Christian friends who've called and said, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know, but, I, but I, what I want to say is I'm praying. And I want to tell you, friend, that's, that's worth it all tonight. I don't want to tell you. In Psalms 121, the psalmist lifted up his eyes to the hills. But if you look here in 123, now he lifts his, up his eyes to the Lord. In 122, he visited the thrones of the house of David. Now in 123, he's lifting up his eyes to the throne of God in heaven. In, in Psalms 123, uh, we find just four verses. It is a very brief psalm. And uh, somebody said, well, what does this teach us? Well, one thing it teaches us is that prayers don't always have to be long to be answered. Somehow, other than the Baptist church world, we swallowed something a long time ago that caused us to believe that in order to get a prayer answered, you had to pray a long prayer. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, God, God's not impressed with, the, with long prayer. In fact, I, Janet and I have been reading through Matthew on Sunday uh, 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 during our morning devotion, and boy... I was reading this morning the words of our Lord to that crowd of scribes and Pharisees about their long prayers and they're making a show of their religion. God's not impressed with a show in your life. So it teaches us you don't have to pray long to be heard. It also preaches us that, uh, teaches us that, that uh, God doesn't look at the length or the language of our prayers. I had a, I had a fellow come to me s several years ago and, and he said, Preacher, I... I you know, he said, I'm almost embarrassed when somebody calls on me to pray in public. And, and he mentioned somebody. And he said, I can't pray like that person can pray. I said, let me tell you something. God's not in, at all impressed with, with your vernacular, with your, able, your ability to use words. God's not impressed. With, you see, what God, God's looking beyond your mouth. He's looking at your heart. That's what the Lord's looking to in our lives. And I think, boy, what a good lesson that is here. But there's something more important than that here. And I want to go to that tonight. The main thing this psalm teaches us is that we ought to be looking to the Lord for what? For mercy in our lives. I never cease to be amazed at the different views, the different attitudes that people have about God. And some, some of them have very negative attitudes about God. But what this psalm teaches us is that God is good and God is kind and God is loving and that our God is a merciful God. 
And he gives freely to those who will seek him for that mercy in their lives. All right, you've got your Bible open. Let's read the verses, and then I'll just hit on three or four things in these four verses tonight. Notice, he says, Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heaven. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden look unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Let's pray. Father, bless the reading of your word tonight. My remarks will be of no value at all without your touch on them, and I pray for that tonight. May the truth of your word shine brightly through to our darkened hearts and help us, Lord, to, to see through the wickedness of our lives to the truth of your word. And I pray that the truth of your word would minister to our needy hearts tonight. We'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. The entirety of this psalm is about looking for mercy. The, the theme of looking is introduced in the first two verses. Uh, the word eyes, look at it. It's right there, right in front of you tonight. The word eyes is used four different times. So that just simply tells us that the psalmist is looking for something. And as we read on down, we find that what he's looking for is the mercy of God. Verses three and four, mercy is used three times. And so it's evident here that uh, the psalmist is in trouble and, and he's crying out for the mercy of God. What is the mercy of God? We've talked about grace and mercy. What is the mercy of God? The mercy of God is the withholding of deserved punishment. It is asking God not to give us what we deserve. Grace is us asking of God to give us what we don't deserve. <laughs> That's his goodness and kindness in our lives. And you look here and you find that the psalmist is in trouble. He's being mocked. He's being scorned by arrogant people who have no concern for God. And so he looks to the Lord for mercy. Have you noticed, have you noticed in your life that you tend to go in the direction that you're looking? <laughs> you may not have any trouble with it now. But give yourself a little while. Just give yourself a, a few more uh, miles down the road. And you take your eyes off where you're going, and the next thing you know, you're over here. I, I mean, I, I, I can remember when I could drive, I, I could drive halfway home without ever looking up to see the road. But I'm going to tell you, I, I don't take my eyes off the road anymore, because whichever way I'm looking, I look over to the side, and the next thing you know, I've got a wheel off the, off the curb. Whichever way you look, physically you'll go. And the th same thing is true in our spiritual lives. When you begin to look away from God, when you begin to look away from the things of the Lord, then that's exactly what's going to happen in your life. This is one of those psalms for those who have reached the end of their rope. They're at a place where they are in desperate need of the mercy of God. Psalms 23 encourages us to, to look to the Lord and to cast ourselves upon Him. To put ourselves in his hands and to trust him to do what's best in our life. Look to the Lord for mercy in our times of need. And that brings a question in front of us that I want us to consider tonight. How do you do that? How do you look to the Lord for mercy? How do you do that? How, how do you look to the Lord for mercy in the time of need in your life? Well, I, as I looked at these verses, I saw three ways that we ought to look to the Lord for mercy. And I want to examine those for just a minute tonight. Number one, we ought to look to the Lord as the mighty sovereign. What are you talking about? Well, he talks about that in verse one. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. When we find ourselves in need, we need to look to someone who can actually help us in our time of need. The psalmist knows exactly where to look. He lifts his eyes. He, he says here that he lifts his eyes to the Lord whose throne is in heaven. His throne is high above all other principalities and power. 
God has adequate resources to, to help every one of us, no matter what our need may be. But why? Because he's the king of heaven. And by the way, not only the king of heaven, but he's the king of all that is. He is Lord over all. Two things come into view as I look at this here. First of all, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God has nothing to do with this whole doctrine of Calvinism and, and uh, uh, some people being predestined to hell and others predestined to heaven. Don't, don't be afraid of that word sovereignty. That word sovereignty just means that God's in control of everything. Uh, I mean, uh, there's nothing that's not under his control. In Psalms 115 and verse 3, the psalmist said, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. God does what he pleases. But he always pleases to do good and he always pleases to be kind. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, Jesus taught us uh, as his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gave them the model prayer. And really it is a, it, it is a seminar on prayer in the life of the child of God. And he said to them, after this manner pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, God is sovereign in all things. I thank the Lord for people who give their lives to be servants of others, who, who go into public service. I'm very thankful for that tonight. Uh, but, but you see, God's not like the mayor of Rossville or the mayor of Chattanooga. God, God's not like our governor in Georgia or, our, or the governor in Tennessee. God is not like our state representatives or our national representatives. God is, God is not like the president of the country or, or some other type of, of ruler. Uh, he, he, is, he, is all, he is sovereign in all things. I listened this afternoon in frustration uh, after Biden met with uh, Putin in, in their meeting. And, and I, I'd, I'd caught a little bit of this early in the week about this, uh, this Marine that has been literally imprisoned as a hostage, and that's all he is in Russia. They're holding him, trying to swap him for some political prisoners here. And, and I, I listened to those, the parents of that young Marine, this, uh, our, our, our Marine, I don't know how young he is, uh, this morning talking about their son and how they hoped something would be done to bring him home. But nothing was done. Nothing was done. Uh, they implored the president to do all that he could to see that their son uh, uh, come, would, would be released and could come, ho come home. Earthly rulers are not all powerful, but I can tell you tonight, God is all powerful. There, there's not anything that our God cannot do. God's throne is in heaven and, and God is sovereign over all things. I don't understand all that he does, but I can tell you he is in control of everything. When we direct our attention to the Lord, as the king on his throne. His throne is a reminder that he's the one who can actually help us. Look, look at verse 2 in, in uh, Psalms 121. The psalmist said, My help cometh from where? From the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Look, look at chapter 124 and, and verse number 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who did what? Who made heaven and earth. Our God is sovereign tonight. When we, when we go to him looking for mercy, we need to go looking to him as the mighty sovereign. He's sovereign. But it also, as we think about that, reminds us of his majesty. Not only his sovereignty, but his majesty. Listen to the words of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10, 11, and 12. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. I can tell you tonight, God is great above all things. When we, think about, when we think about him as the mighty sovereign, we think about his majesty. He's majestic in power. He's majestic in glory. He's majestic in honor. We, we worship him. Why? Because of his greatness, because of his majesty. Brother Spurgeon, in his uh, commentaries on, on the book of Psalms, said of this psalm, it's good to have someone to look up to. Everybody needs somebody to look up to in this world. 
I'm glad I grew up with, with, a, with, a, with a godly father to look up to. I'm thankful that my dad set an example for me to look up to. But, but dad was a Christian. And the example he set pointed me to, to my heavenly father. And, and that's what God wants every father to do, to set an example of a godly, gracious man that would point children, daughters and sons, to, to God, our heavenly father. And we thank the Lord tonight. We look up to him. Now, I, I appreciate all my friends. I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the wonderful people who serve in positions in church. But I want to tell you, I've been doing this long enough to have had some people who claim to be an all uh, godly folks let me down. But I'm glad God's never let me down. I'm thankful tonight that I can always look up to him. How do you look to the Lord for mercy in your time of need? Well, first of all, we need to look to the Lord as mighty sovereign. Secondly, Right here in these verses tonight, in, in verse number two, we need to look to the Lord as a meek servant. Look at verse number two. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. The picture in that verse is of a servant with his or her master. And that's how, that's how we must approach God. If we're going to uh, approach Him in a, in a, and, and expect to get any kind of answer to our prayer, we must approach Him not with a haughty spirit, but approach Him in humility. But we're, we're to come before Him uh, acknowledging who, he's, who He is. Not, not only must we look to the Lord as the King on His throne, but, but we must look to Him as a servant looks to His Master. And a servant would never be haughty before his master. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we've got to do is assume the attitude of a servant towards God. That involves several things on our part. Look back in the Old Testament to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10 when his mother took him to the temple and Hannah took him to the temple and left him with Eli and uh, Eli, uh, uh, Samuel woke up in the middle, uh, was awake in the middle of the night because a voice called him and he thought it was Eli calling him. And he jumped up and, and went to Eli and asked him. Uh, and, and Eli said, I didn't call you, son. He did it twice. And finally Eli said, uh, maybe the Lord calling you. Maybe God's speaking to you. The next time, then you answer him. And so he went back and again the Lord uh, called his name Samuel, Samuel. In that time, Samuel said, Speak, for thy servant heareth. You know what he was doing? He was taking the attitude of a servant towards God. Well, what's involved in that? That's important. What's involved? What's involved in the attitude of a servant? Well, first of, first of all, a servant gives attention to the will of his master. I know you've seen it. We all, we all kind of smile at it. <laughs> Some of us probably had parents that had to do this to us. Did your mother have to get, ever have to get your attention? You, you, ever, you ever seen a mother just having a troublesome time with a daughter or son, either one, and she'd take them to the cheeks and say, now look me in the eye. Look me right dead in the eye. And she wouldn't say a word to lay lady. Look right in her eye. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about, listening, being attentive to God's will. Here in verse 2, the servant had his eyes trained on his master. He was looking for the slightest gesture from his master. One of the things I learned early as, as, a, as a child was to pay attention to the eyes and the countenance of my parents. I could tell by the look in, in my mom's eyes or in my dad's eyes. I could tell by the expression on their face whether they were pleased or displeased with me. You see, God not only watches over us, but we're to watch Him. Our eyes are to be on Him. And our daily prayer ought to be this, Lord, what would you have me to do and how can I serve you today? What, what can I do today to serve you? We ought to be attentive to His will. Secondly, if we're going to assume the attitude of a servant, we've got to wait patiently for His timing. We need to wait on the Master because the Master knows what He's doing. You, you notice the word until in the, in the latter part of, of this second verse. Until that he have mercy on us. When you see that word until, it indicates a period of waiting. Waiting. 
learning to wait on God. Here's what I've learned. I've, I've learned that a good deal of the Christian life is spent in the place of waiting, waiting on the Lord. And I am learning. I haven't learned it all yet, but I'm still learning that delays are not always God's denials, but they're simply exercises, spiritual exercises that God is taking us through to stir up our faith, to get us to look more to him. Assume the attitude of a servant involves attention, uh, attention to his will, waiting patiently for his timing, and then number three, being responsive to his commands, doing what he tells us to do. We've got a lot of folks in our world today, some who even profess to be Christians, they got the attitude that they're going to live their life the way they want to live it. Somehow or other, they figured this thing out that they know better how to live their life than God knows how they ought to live their life. And the irony in all that is that you're never going to find real freedom in your life until you become a servant of Jesus Christ, until you've fully given your life to Him. Then secondly, if we're going to, if, 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 if we're going to look to the Lord as a meek servant, we're going to have to know that we're dependent on God for all things in our life. Everything comes to us from the hand of God. You say, well, I'm working. <laughs> Who gave you the breath and the strength? Who is it that'll give you the strength to get out of the bed in the morning? My life and your life is such a slender thread. All God would have to do is twist it like that and life would be over. The psalmist indicates here in this 123rd Psalm that he's completely dependent on the master. It's the master that's controlling his life. He's completely dependent on the master as he looks to the master to meet his needs. Flip back to Psalms 104 with me, just a minute. Psalms 104 and look at verse number 24. Psalms 104 and verse number 24. Psalms 104 verse number 24. O Lord, how manifold are thy works and wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein all uh, things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships, there is the Levithan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. What the psalmist is telling us there is that all of creation is dependent on God and looking to Him for its needs. And you and I, listen. I'm telling you, you're going to struggle in life until you come to that place that you're willing to commit the needs in your life to the Lord. King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 12 was facing a very stressful time. There were three different nations that were coming together uh, bringing their armies against him. And he, he knew that the army of, uh, of Israel didn't have the resources to fight back. And so he prayed to God there in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Well, we may not always like to admit it, but we're completely dependent on God for everything that we have. And we better learn to pray like that. And then thirdly here, if we're going we're gonna to look to the Lord as a meek servant, then we've got to know that he'll help us in our time of need. Flip over just a couple of pages to Psalms 145. I want you to see these verses. Psalms 145, verses 15 and 16. Psalms 145, verses 15 and 16. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. I love what Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 19, but my God shall supply all our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So as believers, then we need to look for God's intervention into our lives. We need to expect it. We need to keep praying because God will help us in our time of need. How do, how do we look for mercy in our time of need? First of all, we need to look to the Lord as our mighty sovereign. Secondly, we need to look to the Lord as a meek servant. And then lastly, we need to look to the Lord as our merciful Savior. Look at verses 3 and 4. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. For we ex are exceedingly filled with contempt. 
Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. You notice that the psalmist cries out for mercy twice in these verses, and he does it in rapid succession. And that that reveals desperation. You, you, You can almost feel the desperation in his voice here. He tells us in in verse number four that he's being mocked. He's being persecuted for his faith. And and so in desperation, he cries out to the Lord for mercy. You and I are not facing situations like the psalmist was facing here. Not yet. We're probably closer than we've ever been in America to facing the very same kinds of things that the psalmist was facing here with all this mess going on about uh, the sodomites and, and this critical race theory and all those things going on today. And, and uh, you, you, you almost have to guard your language, no matter where you are today, to keep from being confronted. And, and, and God only knows how long it's going to be before we see some real terrible things taking place as a result of that. They've already classified our group of people as being uh, terrorists in America. If you came in this building with a Bible tonight, I can tell you what you are. You're a terrorist in America today. If you believe the Bible tonight, then, then you, 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 you're in the way. You're, you're what's hindering this nation from becoming what this crowd believes it ought to be. Well, the, the, the psalmist is in a time of desperation here. And in that time of des- desperation, he looks to the Lord as his merciful Savior. Now, notice... Four things here that just I just touch them and you you write them down that 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 the Lord does in our time of suffering. Number one, He sees your suffering. God knows what's going on in your life and mine. You know, sometimes we we think about where we are, and I, I thought about I was talking about that couple a moment ago with their son. I got a nine-year sentence. I believe I heard him say this afternoon in, in Russia. Got 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 more prison time than. Than, than criminals get and, and, and begging the president to do something about it. And, and yet, you know, they just turned a blind eye to all that. I can tell you they may not see the suffering, but God does. In Exodus 3 and verse 7, the Lord says about his people, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, how long had the, the children of Israel been in Egypt? 400 years. They've been down there 400 years. And they probably thought that God had forgotten about them. But I want to tell you, God had not forgotten about them. God saw their suffering. And I can tell you tonight, God sees your suffering. Whatever it may be, God sees it. But there's a second thing here. Not only does he see your suffering, but he cares about your suffering. That's what Moses said. uh, God said to Moses in Exodus 3 and verse 7, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people. I've heard their cry. God cares. God God only sees what's going on, but he cares about it. If you you ever doubt that God cares about your suffering, all you need to do is look at God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is, is focus our eyes on him to be able to see that God cares for us and our suffering and our needs. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews said about that in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I am convinced tonight in my life that, that a lot of my struggle and a lot of my suffering has come about simply because I wasn't smart enough spiritually to take my need to the Lord and trust Him to take care of it. I tried to take care of it myself. He sees our suffering. He cares about our suffering. And He knows our limit. He knows how far to go. Look at the word exceedingly in verse 3 and in verse 4. If you look that word up in, in, in Strong's Concordance, you, you'll find that it... it it comes from a word that means to have had enough. It, it comes from a word that, that literally means to, to have had more than enough. That, that, that not only have you been loaded, but you've been overloaded. And that's exactly what the psalmist is expressing here. Lord, I can't carry this any further. 
I, I just can't deal with this load any further. I, I've gone as far as I could go. And, and, and I believe what the Lord is saying to us here. When you've had enough, when you've had more than enough, how comforting to know that God knows our limits. God knows exactly what we're able to carry. Look back again in your Bible to Psalms 103. Psalms 103, verses 13 and 14. Psalms 103, verses 13 and 14. Beautiful word. These are some of the most blessed words that you'll find concerning our Heavenly Father. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. God knows our limit. He knows, he knows exactly wh where the limit is. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God sees our suffering. He cares. He knows our limits. And then last of all, the psalmist tells us that he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The proud here in, in Psalms 123 are, are the complacent. You see it right there. He said they're at ease. They're, they're complacent. They're those who, who are not suffering as the people of Israel in the psalm. They're arrogant. They're, they proudly look down on those who are suffering. Be careful. Be careful how... How you witness the suffering of other people and how, what thoughts you allow to enter into your mind. Listen to what the Lord says about the arrogant and the proud in Isaiah 13, 11. And I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Believe me, I can tell you tonight I've watched it through the years and I certainly haven't seen it all but I have watched it through the years. Watch that haughty, proud crowd. You just watch them. I can promise you it's not going to be far down the road until God's going to let the air out of all the tires on their spiritual car and they're going to find themselves in a mess. They don't receive God's mercy because they don't think they need His mercy. Those who don't, who don't recognize their need of His mercy are not going to receive His mercy. James 4 and verse 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And the humble are those who look to the Lord for mercy. Who is it that God gives mercy to? Those who are looking to him for that mercy. Now, if you're a sinner, if you're lost, then above everything else, you need God's mercy. And, and the place to begin there is crying out like the, the tax collector did in Luke 8, 13, 18, 13, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But if you're a Christian struggling with the pressures and the difficulties of this world, what you need to do is lift your eyes as the psalmist did here in Psalms 123 and cry out to God for mercy in your life. Look to the hand, the mighty hand of the sovereign. Look, look to him as a meek servant. Let him know that you're nothing more than his servant. And look to him as the merciful Savior, the one who is merciful. God is, God is not hard-hearted. I can tell you tonight, God, God is never hard-hearted. He's not like me. There have been some times that, that I've had to go back and, and beg for God to forgive me because I reacted in hard-heartedness rather than re reacting with a soft and tender heart in mercy. And I want to tell you, God never reacts with a hard heart. God is always merciful. And as a child of God, he's already to hear, always ready to hear our cry when the time of need comes. I don't know where you'll need this. I have no idea when you'll need this. But I can tell you, if you live very much longer in this world, you're going to need God's mercy in your heart and life. And I hope you'll remember what we've looked at tonight. Let's pray. Miss Janet's coming to the piano, and she'll just softly play through a verse tonight. And if you've got need to talk to the Lord, I'd encourage you to do that tonight. If you feel comfortable and want to come and get in the altar and pray, then that, that's up to you. But if you've got need tonight and you're struggling with need, you're, you're struggling with things that you don't even know what to do with, why don't you lift your eyes to him tonight and ask him for mercy? 
and help in your life. Father, bless these moments now. You've spoken to us out of your word. Now it's time for us to respond to what you said to our hearts. And I pray you'd help us to do that in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me for just a minute? Heads bowed and eyes closed. God has spoken. You respond to him tonight.